Ja. The Walking Dead is one of the most overrated TV shows of all time. And that's not to say that it has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. The pilot episode was incredibly well done for a TV show and it did have a really solid first season. But season two done goofed. Nobody really seemed to care. I think in this day and age especially, a lot of people are just drawn to it because it's a TV show about zombies. And holy shit are people obsessed with zombies nowadays. You can slap that on just about anything and it'll sell. I'm shocked that it's one of the biggest things at Comic-Con because like I said, I thought it was an obscure little zombie thing. Well, of course, Five years ago, zombies were not in the cultural mainstream as they are now. When I was a kid, most people wouldn't know what a, you know, mainstream viewers wouldn't know what a zombie story was. Now, it's like grandma goes to the Barnes and Noble and buys the zombie survival guide joke book for, for her grandchildren. It's like, it becomes so mainstream, and honestly, it's literally like in the last four years, it's exploded into this mainstream thing. Despite how shitty and overhyped this show eventually became, I still think its roots are pretty admirable. The show was originally a graphic novel by Robert Kirkman, and then adapted by Frank Darabont for television, which is kind of awesome because we already know how well he can translate literary works into film. How do we, how do we make a great episode here? How do we tell this story the best way? And if we're going to veer away from Robert Kirkman's material, how do we do it intelligently, respectfully, and in a way we're going to be able to veer back to it when we need to? One of the really great things that Frank is able to do with the show is he just takes these little bits that I just blew past on my way to get to the next issue, and he'll expand it and, and, and turn it into something remarkable that I didn't even know could be done. Frank Darabont had no intention of milking a cash cow, and he only wanted to create the fresh but faithful adaptation that Robert Kirkman himself would be happy with. One could also say that Frank Darabont's familiarity with film helped turn the pilot episode into more of a movie experience. We're making a movie and, and whatever we need to do to have that sense of scale and quality is what we're going to do. And although I do really love Frank Darabont and his involvement with the show, the first season isn't exactly what I'd call flawless. But if there's one thing I really appreciate about it, it's tone, which is driven forward by its incredibly selective use of background music. Some composers are great, but it shows a lot of self-awareness and maturity to know when not to use music. Could you imagine how cheesy the opening scene would be if there was a scare cue when she turned around? <laughs> And speaking of cheesy, does anybody else feel that way about the opening title sequence or what? We kick off the series with the main character Rick waking up in the hospital from a coma, which seems a little too much like 28 Days Later, especially considering the film came out a year before the graphic novel was made. But even though it kind of bugs me, I'm willing to say that that was probably more of an homage than a ripoff. And hey, it's a good way to introduce the main character and thus your viewers to this world. Just dive right into the action and come to the horrific realizations yourself. Don't dead open inside? Uh, okay. One thing I'd like to know is where did his pee go? Even if you're being fed through a tube, you still pee when you're in a coma. Sometimes they use catheters. Firmly pinch the end of the penis for several minutes to retain the lidocaine within the urethra. Place the tip of the catheter into the meatus and advance it slowly and gently through the urethra. But if you're gonna be out for a while, they'll just put a big diaper on you. And it doesn't look like he's wearing a diaper. If somehow he is wearing one though, for the amount of time he's been unconscious, he would probably see some wet spots. Come to think of it, if no one was taking care of him for 45 days, wouldn't he have some pretty horrific bed sores? Nurses are required to move patients every two hours to stop that from happening. And if left untreated, it could lead to an amputation. I know, I know, The Walking Dead's not the only thing that's guilty of this, but I still feel it's it's at least worth pointing out. And remember, I actually really like this episode, so it obviously didn't ruin it for me. It's okay to recognize flaws in something and like it at the same time. There's plenty to appreciate early on in the show, and if you mostly watch it for the zombie makeup effects, I don't really expect you to give a fuck about the script, because Greg Nicotero does a pretty good job. Anyway, Rick decides to sit down in some random place and he gets clocked in the head by some fucking kid. <laughs> the kid and his dad take him in and nurse him back to health. Then Rick's able to get a bunch of guns from the police lockers. It's not a toy. Always remember that, Dwayne. Dwayne! And he invites them both to go with him, but instead the conversation goes like this. Are you sure you won't come along? A few more days. By then, Dwayne will know how to shoot and I won't be so rusty. I don't understand how that's an excuse. I'm okay with them not joining along, but you think they could have found a better excuse. We're not really good at shooting zombies yet, so we're not gonna try and join you to try and escape the zombies. We'll just stay back here where there are a bunch of zombies around. So you're using the fact that you can't shoot as an excuse not to be around the guy that can? Wouldn't it be in your son's best interest to be around someone that can protect him well? Do you not consider yourself extremely lucky that your house hasn't already been overthrown by zombies? Despite how inevitably stupid that decision is, 
It is possible that he's lying. He goes home and wastes no time trying to hunt down his dead wife with that new rifle, and it leaves the impression that this could be some unfinished business. But at least it provides an excuse to show some really good reincorporation. Rick mentioned that he knew that his wife and son were still alive because the photographs were missing, and then Morgan says how his wife had their photo albums in high priority. Yeah, I am packing survival gear. She's grabbing photo albums. The reason why I think it's so incredibly well reincorporated is because there's no indication that they're going to bring it back until it actually happens. The original conversation served more than one purpose, rather than just planting it there for the explicit purpose of bringing it back. Why can't more things be written like this? Anyway, Rick makes his way to Atlanta and finds a horse along the way, and because of his carelessness, it gets murdered. Yep, he just ran into a conveniently placed wall of zombies. Now I get that we're already supposed to believe that zombies are things that can survive as long as their brains aren't damaged, and despite how that's partially forgivable just because it's a zombie thing. The super strength kind of bugs me at times. I could reasonably assume that a bunch of them could overpower a person, and also overpower a horse. But to just start eating it like that? I don't care how strong the muscles on your fingers are, they would break if you tried to rip open a horse's stomach with them. Their skin is not that thin. Suddenly the horse's body is the consistency of mashed potatoes. Again, it's not something completely damning, but I think it would have been kind of cool to have the zombies struggling to try and break open the skin. I pull on it so hard. I ripped the skin. You know, having a couple of them biting the jugular at the same time and then pulling in opposite directions, that might work. Having super strength is within my suspension of disbelief, but having like steel reinforced fingers and fingernails that are able to rip open a horse's stomach is kinda dumb. Anyway, I thought this episode was great overall and it was a pretty awesome way to start the series. Episode two starts and we learn that Rick's wife slutting it up. Yeah, I get it, it was a fake scare and we were supposed to think she is in danger and then be like, oh haha, ha, she's not actually in danger. But how stupid is Shane for doing that during a zombie apocalypse? I don't care how lonely you are, that should be a deal breaker. What if you had a knife on you? Oops, I accidentally just stabbed you in self-defense, sorry. Anyway, Rick manages to shoot his way out of his situation. <laughs> Man, you're really making every bullet count. Fucking headshots while you're running. He meets up with the rest of the group and we see a zombie trying to smash through the window with a piece of concrete. Why do you need that? Why don't you just puncture the glass with your super fingers? They then need to escape the building, so they come up with a brilliant plan of pretending that they're zombies by putting a bunch of zombie blood on themselves. And it actually works. That is until it rains and then all their zombie smell washes off somehow. Everything was going great until it started to pour with rain. That the zombies started smelling them and realize that they aren't zombies, that they're actually real uh, people, which means it's food, and they go after them. I would assume that you'd still smell like a zombie, but just a wet zombie. Have you ever heard any testimonials from crime scene cleanup? Anyway, these two create a diversion and pick up the rest of them, except the one really racist guy that got handcuffed upstairs. Oops. Season one, episode three is where the pacing starts to change a little. It becomes much less about the zombies and a lot more about the characters. There's been a lot of shit going on and the characters need some time to process it. Not to mention that it's good that we learn a few things about these characters too. I miss my vibrator. This is also the episode we get introduced to Daryl, everyone's favorite. It's a fun weapon and everybody looks cool holding a crossbow. It's it's not a M16. Anyway, a few of them go back to save Daryl's racist brother, but it turns out he already left. Oops. Episode four continues developing characters, but also keeps the action moving along as well. But if there's one thing that I kind of dislike about the television slot formula, it kind of makes things a bit more predictable. We pull a surprise or two out of the hat in episode four that I think will really Surprise. When you've got a shit ton of B-side characters that have all been relatively equally ignored throughout the series so far, and then you give some of them an extremely abnormal amount of screen time and attention, all it makes me think is, hey, I wonder what's gonna happen to these characters by the end of the episode. And wouldn't you know it, shit goes down. And it's not something that's exclusive to this television show in particular, but it's kind of annoying that most TV shows have those constraints in the first place. I mean, you have to imagine that that only really happens because the writers expect people to be watching this episode without having seen the first few episodes. So rather than building her character consistently in a way that would surprise you when she dies, they just throw in as much shit as they possibly can in one episode. It's Amy's birthday tomorrow. And didn't dad teach you to tie nail knots? It's not his fault we were born 12 years apart. Our dad. Mom and dad. Did that teach you mostly dry lures? Don't get me wrong, I think it's much better for a person to have character before they die, but if she was anything more than just an expendable nobody before this episode, then it wouldn't seem so out of place for a character to finally be explored in what just oh so happens to be the episode that she dies at the end of. Yep, 
Yep, I get it. They're sisters. Thanks for telling me. Thanks for telling me again. Yep, they're sisters. Now I feel really bad because I know that they're sisters. And what's the deal with people when they die from zombies anyway? Yep, let me stand perfectly still while this person bites me so the blood explodes on the right spot for makeup purposes. Does that not take anybody out of it at all? We can't have somebody like violently spazzing out while they're getting eaten or what? They're all just so scared that they don't move and that's why it's happening. Every single person ever does that, don't you know? Episode 5 comes along and Andrea finally decides she needs to kill her zombie sister. That would probably hurt your ears. Now you've probably noticed that I'm skimming through these episodes in season 1 just so I can get to the colossal fuck up that is season 2, but there's something in this episode that I feel that I need to point out. Please somebody tell me that they recognize this song. No, it's not just that one song from Kick-Ass. It's called Adagio in D minor, and it was composed by John Murphy in Underworld for the film Sunshine. And ever since then, people have destroyed it by feeling they have to put it in everything. I need you to trust me. Okay. I see you. After all this time, I actually see you. On an incredible IMAX 3D journey through time and space. Why can I see you and no one else can? You know, the mundane. Striker say we'll be making a difference. You don't discover this essence. It discovers you. God, can we not have one great song that isn't shamelessly regurgitated throughout every trailer and advertisement ever? It kind of fucking ruins it for the people paying attention. I'm not saying you should hate this episode because of it. After all, the decision to include it could have been before this rush of blatant recycling. But now that you know where it's from, could you at least pay a bit of respect to its origins? It's a good movie. So it's the last episode of the season and the characters make it to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And there turns out to only be one person there because everybody else died. So everybody gets really drunk. And the day after, the doctor says, actually, this place is gonna blow up and all the doors are locked now. And since I wanna die, you all have to die too. Nya, nya. And then they convince him to let them escape, but two of the characters decide that they actually wanna die anyway. Dale tries his best to save Andrea and winds up convincing her to leave, but it's too late for that black lady. Nobody cares about you. Oh. What's an escape without running gun headshots with your pistol? Ah. And thus ends season one. It's a great, great way to end the season and have everybody at the end of it, hopefully, ask, is there a chance of a cure? How will they survive? Where will they go? We need next season to, to answer all these questions. Despite its few shortcomings, it was a huge critical and financial success for the network. The Walking Dead social game is now on Facebook. Enter the world of the survivors. Embark on missions with your Facebook friends. All thanks to Frank Darabont and his hard work and commitment to a project that he nurtured from birth. So Andrew Lincoln referred to this as your baby. So tell us how kind of proud you are. I mean, fuck, we're making so much money off of it. We should give the guy a bigger budget now, right? Fucking nope. AMC decided they wanted to save as much money as possible. Frank Darabont and the crew had been in an ongoing battle with AMC over the show's budget. And despite being a huge hit for the network, AMC was even brazen enough to suggest things like, Oh, can't we just hear the zombies instead of seeing them? That would save money on makeup. Artistic integrity. Mm -hmm. So why did they do this? Because they can. The Walking Dead is actually the only show that AMC owns in its entirety. Shows like Mad Men and Breaking Bad are actually co-owned by Lionsgate and Sony. So if there are any disputes between the network and show creators, at least there's a third party. But not with The Walking Dead. If you don't like it, then you can suck it because we own your whole show, bitch. I don't think it will affect the show creatively. Right, it'll, it'll ultimately. In a negative way, right? which just strikes me as odd, right? You know, if you have an asset, <laughs> why would you... Punish it. Punish right. it. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. Not only did they cut the season's budget from 3.4 million to 2.7 million, they also demanded that there would be 13 episodes instead of six. And hey, that 30% tax credit that went towards the show's budget in season one for filming in Georgia, let's take that too! Despite this massive fuck you to Frank Darabont from the network, he still decided that he was going to try and do the show as best as he could. But God, was it a massive blow. You can tell that the cast and crew had some major issues with the budget cuts just by looking at their faces after this question at Comic-Con. How has going into the second season going, you have more episodes, you probably have some more budget. Is it is it is that a little bit scarier to know that you have more resources in a way? <laughs> it's uh it's a bit of it's a bit of pressure, you know, knowing that uh, everybody loves the show and there's an expectation now, but uh, I can say that you know it, it's just made everyone work harder and Frank jump in anytime you want, but like it's it's we know that the, it, it, it it's empowered us to try harder. Despite all these punches that AMC was throwing their way, they still tried their best to market the show and work with what they had. I'm working with my friends that are so good at what they do, and I think fans, I think you're gonna be so thrilled. She wasn't kidding when she was saying she was working with her friends. Anyone familiar with Frank Darabont's The Mist would recognize that he used a lot of the same actors. Here's a guy 
who gets his cast and crew together and gives them to AMC, packages this whole show and gives them a show that is way cheaper than it would be meant to make anywhere else because everyone is working well under their pay grade. Why? Because they want to and love working with Frank Darabont. That's what's going on. He shared with me what kind of pay cuts people have been taking. And I also am friends with other people on that set, certain department heads. And I know they're not, you know, they, they stepped up because they wanted to work with Frank. Some of these people went to high school with Frank. Yep, Frank Darabont handed this whole show to AMC on a fucking platter. And three days after this very same press release at Comic-Con 2011, they fired him. Thanks for creating one of the most successful shows on our network. Goodbye! The saddest thing is, you know, when I was at Comic-Con, which is three days before that announcement, I'm talking to him, and he goes, you know, it's hard to do the show. It's really, really hard to, to do this show for the money that they're making me do the show. But you know what? I have to. And I was like, well, you know, why? Why do you have to? He goes, because I got all these people into this. I got all these cast members to do this. I got all my friends to pull in favors. I've gotten all these people to do things for nowhere near the money they're worth, nowhere near the money they get paid anywhere else. And the reason I have to show up and do my best, no matter what budget AMC gives me, is because I owe it to everyone that's working. And then three days later, three days later, and by the way, they knew two weeks before. They knew two weeks before. Fuck you. With Frank kicked out of the game, they replaced him with his second-hand man, Glenn Mazzara. There'll be a script coming down the road that'll be in my voice, and it's going to create a panic. And they all were like, okay, and then we released that script a few weeks later and it created a big panic. I had, I started to have a feeling of what I thought the show should be, but it was different from what we had done. I never wanted it, you know, to be a competition between me and Frank. That's not fair, you know, and, and to clarify the earlier point, you know, I knew we had trouble on the show. We had some problematic, we had a problematic season premiere. So I, I knew we were working on a problem. Um, Budget-wise or shooting or... Just, just, just the, uh, the story didn't hang together. The footage came in, it wasn't what we wanted. You know, it was just something that needed reshoots and editing and it was just a problem. Yeah, let's replace the director of Shawshank Redemption with the man that created this. Previously on Crash. I love you. Oh. My love for you is against the rules. You're gonna leave your wife? And you think a major bathroom remodel is gonna make them love you? Fuck you, AMC. You know what's the worst part about all these backstabbing financial decisions that they made? They were right. AMC doesn't give two shits about making compelling television. Remember, they don't have anything to do with the actual creation of the show. All they want to do is make money off of it. And it fucking worked. No one even seemed to notice the show's extreme drop in quality due to a lack of a sufficient budget. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'm here to show you. You think you were blown away season one? Season two is incredible. It's, it's, it's doubly incredible. Season two is more action-packed. It's even more dramatic, if you can believe that. The stakes are higher. The characters are richer. Why is T-Dog continuing to go on? Season two, it's just really, really testing the faith and the hope of everybody. The writing's so good this year, it's spooky. Episode 1 of Season 2 starts with the characters leaving the city in the hopes of finding a place that isn't infested by zombies. They come across a massive traffic jam on the highway, and everyone's like, great, we can get supplies, and Lori's like, This is a graveyard. Seems like you changed your mind quickly enough. Everyone raids for supplies while Dale keeps watch on top of his RV. And after he turns around for what seems like a few seconds, he spots a zombie. Oh no. It's actually a fuck ton of zombies. But how the fuck did they get that close without anybody noticing? Oh, I know what you're gonna say. It's because they were blocked by those cars, right? Um, do you see that angle? I don't care if Dale was turned around for 10 fucking minutes. There's no way he wouldn't be able to see them before they got that close. You wouldn't even need binoculars. It's a fucking herd. And where did these zombies come from anyway? They really came from the city? Isn't that where you all just came from? And did you not all just come from there at a driving speed? You've been here all but five minutes and the zombies have managed to catch up to you at a turtle pace. Unless we're honestly supposed to believe that Andrea's been trying to put her gun back together for the past five hours. Oh shit, why didn't anybody tell me? Everyone tries to stay super quiet while the zombies go by, but then Andrea gets visited by the only zombie in the entire fucking herd that has half-decent makeup. Just look at that crowd. 
Thanks, AMC. Meanwhile, instead of hiding under a car like everyone else, T-Dog just fucking dicks around and winds up slicing his arm open. At which point I thought, he's dead for sure. You definitely severed a vein there. A rip like that could send you in total shock. I'm surprised that T-Dog didn't just die from just that wound. In fact, it seems as though in the short amount of time that you've cut yourself, you've lost so much blood that you can't even move. Daryl saving me Merle's brother? Merle Dixon's brother? Oh, thanks, Daryl. Get that zombie flesh all up in my open wound. Andrea starts screaming like an idiot, so Dale gives her a screwdriver to use as a weapon. Ah, oh, hey, look, it's the collector's edition Blu-ray box set. I was scared for my life. It felt like I was being violated. <laughs> I got him with that screwdriver. Don't mess with me, zombies. How the fuck did none of the other zombies hear you? It's not as if there was noise coming from anywhere else in the entire fucking area. You're screaming with the door open. Well, looks like it didn't matter because there's no zombies to be heard. Yeah. <laughs> Oh shit, it turns out one zombie was conveniently right next to this little girl and didn't make any noise. That's right, run into the fucking woods. Seriously, that's like the stupidest thing anybody could do. Anyway, Rick goes after her, tells her to run back to the highway while he distracts them, and then he kills them and it turns out she's nowhere to be found. God damn it. Rick and Daryl look for her all fucking day until... Soon. Yes, it's really late in the day and this is not just a really obvious color and brightness filter despite the fact that my head's shadow is clearly defined at a downward slope across my chest. Now there's a reason why AMC wanted 50% of the scenes in season 2 to be indoors. And that's because it's more expensive to shoot outside. And the reason why it's more expensive to shoot outside is because you have to be mindful of natural lighting. Whether the sun's behind the clouds or what time of day it is, etc, etc. But if your budget's stripped to the point of not being able to shoot the same scene at the same time on several different days, especially while the sun's setting, then things start to look a little inconsistent. The shadows go from clearly defined at a downward angle to completely non-existent over the course of 90 seconds in the show. And if you're not bothered by that, that's okay. But having a budget fucking matters. They continue searching the next day and they come across a deer. Yeah, put down your gun chain. Just let my kid walk closer to it while he's fucking ogling it until he scares it away. Why would we want food? Oh, 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 it's a plot device. Okay, I get it. Episode 2 starts with a flashback that really delves into Lori's character. She's a bitch. She starts out complaining that Rick doesn't argue with her enough. He was trying so hard to be reasonable, it just pushed my buttons all the more. The fuck is wrong with you? Shane interrupts the conversation to let her know that Rick is in a coma. And as soon as Carl gets out of school, she tells him the bad news and makes him cry. You couldn't have waited until he walked up to you. You know, away from his peers. Yeah, let's deliver this heart-wrenching news right in front of the fucking door. There's one thing within this episode that I would call a redeeming quality, and that's Andrew Lincoln's performance. He does a great job convincing me that he's a dad that thinks he just lost his son. But as soon as we cut to the filler in this episode, aka the other characters, things start to get really stupid again. So apparently T-Dog is still alive and kicking, but then he starts acting really weird. He starts to look intoxicated, he gets irrationally angry, and he has a crazy fever. And in a show about fucking zombies, you'd think that whoever's writing it would know that those things might easily be associated with turning into a zombie, especially considering the character has a huge fucking gash on his arm. He could have easily been infected at this point, and I'm pretty sure we were all assuming he was, but nope, he was just sick. Now I'm not upset at this part because it's not how I'd prefer for the story to develop, but it really bugs me because these false flags didn't really have any self-awareness to them. Considering the possibility of such a thing happening was never even mentioned by any of the characters, it seems as though the confusion was unintentional. I mean, it doesn't really seem like anybody gives a shit about infecting themselves at this point. It's the bite that counts. Meanwhile, all of these characters are still searching for that little girl. Wait, why are you suddenly so far away from the group when you were just next to them a few seconds ago? Oh, so you can get attacked by a zombie. Okay. Does no one else consider it to be fucking stupid that it was hiding behind a fucking tree? Did it not notice everybody else go by first? Is this a super secret smart zombie that knew that he could trap this one person alone? Or is it just a poorly thought out excuse to add conflict to a scene featuring a group of characters that would otherwise be doing fucking nothing? Yep, they're in danger now. Here's some instant danger for ya. Just add water. It sure is convenient that that zombie was super secret and hiding, because if he was any bit noticeable then he would have just been picked off 
off by Daryl in an instant. Yeah, that zombie totally showed higher cognitive abilities than any of the other ones we've seen thus far, but let's not mention it. This was completely normal and not out of the ordinary in the slightest. Anyway, Lori catches a ride to the farm with this character she's never seen before. And it's kind of hilarious how before they hit the fence, they cut to Rick and then they just show him on the other side of the fence. Shane teams up with Otis, who accidentally shot Carl, to scavenge for medical supplies at a zombie-infested high school. How are they gonna get out of this one, guys? Episode 3 is where the show starts to get really boring. I mean, the drama unfolding with Rick and his son might be more entertaining if it wasn't so stale and repetitive, but AMC says we have to have 13 episodes, so fuck it. Lori's angry at everything, and, and there's a part of Lori that wants to just blame God. What else are you gonna take? You're gonna take the kids now? You gotta be kidding me. Meanwhile, these characters do dick all the entire episode. We can just have them looking for that little girl forever. Sophia being lost has brought out new dynamics in the group. The search for Sophia, from Lori's perspective, becomes about Rick. Rick needs to keep looking for this little girl. I'm gonna go for a walk. Shine some light in the forest. If she's out there, give her something to look at. You think that's a good idea right now? Dale. Yeah, fuck you and your logic, Dale. What else would our characters be doing to fill up screen time? By the end of the episode, they try to pretend as if their trip wasn't completely useless. So Dale gives her back her gun because now he trusts her that she's not gonna kill herself with it. The gun has a lot of symbolism because my dead father gave it to me. It's a very loaded topic because it's insulting to me. Every time you won't give me the gun, it's like, you think I'll kill myself. But there is also some action happening with this one main character and one expendable character that we just met. And by action, I mean they both get headshots with every single shot that they fire. And they both separately took bad landings off of completely different elevated places so that they can have a bit of a limp when they're trying to run away at the end of the episode. Because there really wouldn't be any tension watching two characters run away from Romero-style zombies unless they both had convenient leg injuries. The people in The Walking Dead have it easy. The people out to get them are walking. If you have the ability to break into a light jog, you can survive in that world. Which is also kind of retarded, because back when they were running at normal speed, it seemed like the zombies were keeping up just fine. Frank is very old school. They will not move faster than the first zombie in the original Night of the Living Dead. But now that they've slowed down, I guess the zombies have got to slow down too. At least having a limp doesn't really seem like it's affecting their aim, and it doesn't really seem like they're catching up to them at all. But despite that, Shane decides to shoot Otis in the leg to slow him down even more, which is absolutely fucking retarded because they weren't catching up to them at all. But it's one of many important plot devices devices to keep people arguing with each other the whole season instead of actually doing anything. You know, it'd be a lot more convincing that the zombies were actually catching up to them and this was a decision that Shane was forced to make if they didn't completely stop walking and then fight in the middle of the road for a total screen time of 43 seconds. You had a 43 second lead on them at least. I know you guys didn't park right there, but how fucking far away were you? Shane comes back alone and pretends as if Otis's death was a tragedy that he was not directly responsible for. He pokes his head in to see Lori with her son. And even though she should probably be saying get the fuck out considering last time they were alone he tried to fucking rape her, she decides she'd rather send mixed messages instead. I'm sure that won't encourage any future confusion with this clearly mentally unstable character. God damn it. The value of somebody with whom you share a past. That is irreplaceable. Stay. Through all of the pain and the hurt, it's so close on that spectrum to love. It's like when you get furious with your brother. He's still your brother, and you can't bring yourself to sever a bond of blood, especially when there is so little blood left.